hello to all of you from the future. Joining me tonight on a very special edition, Joel Gilbert is live in the building, my friends. He is an American filmmaker based in Los Angeles. He is known for political documentaries on Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Islamism, as well as music history films on Bob Dylan and comedies featuring Paul McCartney and Elvis Presley. His new film and book is called The Trayvon Hoax, Unmasking the Witness Fraud That Divided America. And of course, on the second half of the program, yet another week. My apologies for not being here last week, but I have returned. Now, enough of the nonsense. Let's get down to brass tacks and bring in the first guest. Joe, are you alive out there? Yes, sir. Here I am. Fantastic. You sound great. Great to be here. Thank you. I do want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program, sir. I know we tried to do this last week, but life gets in the way sometimes. Yeah, I was just coming back from uh, Washington, D.C., where I uh, screened the new film, The Trayvon Hoax, Unmasking the Witness Fraud that Divided America. I was at the National Press Club there in D.C., had a press conference and world premiere screening, and it was quite an event. We had a couple hundred people, of course, absent were the mainstream media that built this narrative that I have completely exposed as a total fraud of the uh, Trayvon Martin case. I call it the Trayvon hoax because uh, the Trayvon hoax is two things. It's the story that I expose of how a real phone witness on the phone with Trayvon Martin right before his death was switched for a fake witness, that being Rachel Gentel. People remember her as the plus-sized Haitian girl that they built the indictment on uh, George Zimmerman with her statements, and she also showed up in court. And then the Trayvon hoax is also the name I give to the hoax that the media plays on black Americans every day, essentially that blacks have to vote Democrat to protect themselves from a racist America where there are armed white men in the streets who want to shoot you because of your skin color. That's, that's the Trayvon hoax in action on the national level. Amazing. And of course, Joe, before we get things started, I do want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into uh, directing and doing this amazing job with investigative journalism. And, you know, I, I use that term journalism in the most sincere and serious way, unlike how it is today. Journalism now is uh, bastardized. Yeah, it's it's a disaster. I mean, look, yes, sir. When I when I was at the National Press Club, uh, talking about this story that uh, changed America, uh, the Trayvon Martin case was ground zero for fake news. It all the modern era started right there. Also, all the race hoaxes, racial division. This is a major story that I'm breaking. That the witness, the key witness that the prosecution built the entire case on, was a fraud. She was substituted for the real witness whom I located, named Diamond Eugene. She's in the movie. This is a major change of American history. And all that day and that, that week when I was in D.C., the mainstream media was obsessing over a story that 30 years ago, Brett Kavanaugh was at a party and did something inappropriate to a woman who can't remember. That was their story. That's how bad it is. Uh, so it... it you know, we can have a whole show about the malfeasance of the mainstream media, but it certainly started uh, the modern era with this case. Uh, I've been making films for about, uh, man, almost 20 years. Um, and I started pr uh, producing films on music icons like Bob Dylan. I did two comedies, uh, one on uh, Paul McCartney and then Elvis Presley, and uh, also very serious uh, films <laughs> on Middle East history, uh, the Islamic Jewish conflict, one called Farewell, Israel, uh, Bush, Iran, and the Revolt of Islam. Also, Atomic Jihad about the Iranian nuclear program and several other films, including last year. Uh, well, of course, Dreams from My Real Father. I'm pretty well known for that, where I went yes. to Hawaii twice and I researched Obama's background. I went there twice. That was twice as much as all the mainstream media combined that went there to figure out what Obama's real background was. And in that film, I put together an alternate history of Barack Obama called Dreams from My Real Father. And I went to investigate the person that he admit raised him and influenced him was Frank Marshall Davis, was a black Bolshevik, one of the Chicago communists that went out to Hawaii. And Davis was a Russian agent. He was uh, uh, acting on behalf of the Soviet Union, and he was under FBI surveillance for 20 years because of his uh, treachery. And this is the man that raised Obama. And then I put forth a theory based on a lot of evidence that this, in fact, was Obama's real biological father. 
and I traced the history of Obama's policies and showed how they mirrored uh, the communist rantings of Frank Marshall Davis, his his father and mentor. Um, and last year, of course, was I had a, a film called There's No Place Like Utopia. It was kind of like a Michael Moore style film where I run around the country talking to people in progressive cities where people really were regressing. They weren't progressing at all. And uh, last year was the uh, hilarious comedy I produced called Trump, the Art of the Insult. Yes. You know, but you actually learn a lot about Trump. You learn about his branding and marketing. It's not only a comedy. You really un- come to understand Trump once you see that movie. Uh, so I've always just uh, made films where my curiosity lie. And, uh, you know, this latest film uh, is because of that, because I saw it had such an impact on the country. I thought it needed to be investigated. Yes. And you've done a fantastic job and you've gone just beyond any other means. I've never seen anyone really go in the way you have, Joel, with your work. You are able to track down all these uh, players and all these impact players and in, in the, in these narratives. And that is tremendous. I've never seen anyone do that before. Well, this was quite the investigation. I can, I'll, I'll uh, agree to that. It started by I was looking at uh, Trayvon Martin's uh cell phone records, all public information. And just to give you the background is, uh, let me reset for your audience, is uh, Trayvon Martin was tragically shot in this altercation on February 26, 2012. And the police investigated for two weeks, two and a half weeks. And they looked at the eyewitnesses, spoke to eyewitnesses, uh, 911 calls. They listened to physical evidence, Zimmerman statements, uh, lie detector test, everything. And they said, this is a case of self-defense. It's not stand your ground, pure self-defense. Zimmerman was getting his head bashed in the ground for several minutes and broken nose, choking on his blood. A man came out and told Trayvon to stop or he called the police. He wouldn't stop. And uh, Zimmerman fired a single shot to try to save his life. And the police agreed with that based on all the evidence. See you later. It's over. And the family attorney and the the Martin family had already brought in uh, an attorney. Al Sharpton was coming into town. They were putting on pressure with uh, Change.org. All the leftist organizations were getting mobilized. And uh, the family attorney, Benjamin Crump, holds a press conference a week later, and he holds up a um, digital recorder. And he said, Tracy Martin, you know, Trayvon's father, just found this phone number on his phone records last night. And it was this girl named Diamond. She's a, a minor. She's 16 years old. And uh, she gave us this interview. So he plays a couple excerpts of this phone interview with Diamond. And it's not even that intelligible. But he says at the end, we've got all the evidence now. Arrest George Zimmerman. And I'm going to give this tape to the FBI. So the next day, Obama jumps into the case. He says, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. Right. I remember you that. Know, the, the day after that, LeBron James gets on board, the NBA. Uh, the uh, the kids are protesting in the streets, walking out of schools, and the state of Florida is pressured by the media to appoint a special counsel. So all because of this public pressure, even though the police already decided it was self-defense. So the state attorneys come down to uh, Miami about 10 days after that to interview Diamond, the 16-year-old girlfriend. And they go to Diamond's house. Her name is Diamond Eugene. They go to her address. I've actually got the address in the unredacted documents. That's where she lives. Uh, her mother, Eliana Eugene, it's on the record. And they someone sends them away to a different house where uh, a woman who works for Trayvon's mother lives. And the prosecution goes there and there appears Rachel Gentel. She's 18. She's a year older than Trayvon, 150 pounds heavier. She says, I'm the girlfriend. I'm, I just lied about my name to Mr. Crump. I'm, I, I said I was Diamond Eugene. I said I, I lied about my age. I, I lied about going to the hospital. I'm, I'm Diamond Eugene. And the, you know, why the prosecution didn't stop the interview right there and say, let's just stop this nonsense right here. But they took her statements that didn't make very much sense at all. And at the end of the interview, you can even see in the trailer at the, the TrayvonHooks.com, in the trailer itself, she actually, I have the recording where at the end of her interview, she's overwhelmed. And she says to the prosecutor, I feel guilty. I feel real guilty. She says it six times. She says, why do you feel guilty about talking to us? And Rachel says, I know about it. And they go, what? She goes, I know about it. So she actually confesses that she's lying, but they ignore that. And they take a couple of her statements from this interview and they indict Zimmerman 10 days later. And of course, they have the trial a year later. 
And uh, same thing, Rachel Gentile comes to court. She lies herself, to, you know, ridiculous lies. And uh, she turns out she wrote a letter to Trayvon's mother that she can't read. She doesn't know how to read. So uh, this is kind of the timeline for you. But I had recalled that uh, the, the girl on the phone from the recorded uh, digital audio that the family attorney Crump had played to the media, I, I have a pretty good ear because I'm a musician and film editor as right. well. Got a pretty good ear. And I remember that the girl, the voice of the girl on the digital recorder did not sound like the same person as Rachel Gentile. No match. Yeah. Two very distinctive voices. So I recall that. So the way I approached this was I said, uh, if I can find the original girl, Diamond Eugene, and find out why she bailed out, why she was substituted, who knew, and I can prove it, I'll make a film and write a book about it. And that's that's how I got into it. And you found her. I found her. That's the way wild. I found her was I started with Trayvon Martin's cell phone records. Beware Cell phones have so much information oh, on yes. it. There was <laughs> 3,000 text messages, 3,000 emails. Oh, I'm sorry, 3,000 text messages, 3,000 photos, 1,500 contacts, hundreds of emails, GPS coordinates. Wherever Trayvon was, I had all his GPS coordinates. So I was able to go through these text messages and learn so much about this case that nobody knew. Uh, first thing that stood out is that, that Trayvon Martin really was a pretty good kid, a normal high school kid. Uh, during the, you know, beginning of the time of the eight months that I was reading about his messages and, and I knew about his life, it was only the last three months where he took a big downhill dark turn. Uh, his father had divorced his stepmother, Alicia Stanley, and uh, he lost his home base. Uh, he'd lived there for like 14 years. He lost his stepmother, had to go back and live with his biological mother. And that's when he started acting out very badly. He started fighting, always fighting, fighting in school. He tried to hit a bus driver, uh, heavy marijuana use, uh, dealing guns. He was into worse and worse behaviors that were just in a downhill spiral that led to this uh, his terrible decision to attack Zimmerman and, and not even let up. Uh, so I learned a lot about Trayvon, but yeah. also it stood out is the girlfriend named Diamond. Diamond. Diamond is texting Trayvon photos. She say, he says, text, send me a pic, send me a pic. She texts him photos. There it is right there in the photo library, in the, in the records. It's not Rachel Gentile. Rachel Gentile's unmistakable. She was about 220, 30, 40 pounds and very tall, wide head. This girl was, uh, you know, goes, went about 110 at the most, uh, thin, uh, it's not, not Rachel Gentile. So that's, uh, I realized I had stumbled upon a monumental fraud of the justice system. And how, but how did that even pass? That's the question. How did they get away with it? Correct. Well, there are a number of ways they got away with it. Number one, of course, we, we alluded to already the media, uh, the media should have done what I did. All this was public information just there for the plucking, you know, you just had to go look at it. And then I would look online and look at these girls, Twitter accounts and, uh, Facebook. It's all there. I mean, Diamond Eugene was tweeting a, right when Trayvon was shot. She tweeted about it. She was tweeting nonstop every 20 minutes. So it's just ridiculous. She didn't even think to to erase her old, you know, social media archive. Uh, so it's just all there for the taking. So the media yes. only wanted to uh, fuel a race narrative because they wanted to get Barack Obama reelected. They were working with Obama. Uh, Obama sent his uh, community relations service down from the Department of Justice uh, when this was going on. He said they're going to help investigate. Instead, they actually organized protests coming out of Washington. And the media was on board for this. They knew that uh, everything had gotten worse for uh, black Americans since Obama was elected. Nothing got better. The economy was flatlining, that he was raising taxes. All the businesses were shutting down in the inner cities. Obama was allowing illegals to come in and take over their jobs. Obama had done nothing for black America uh, and things had only gotten much worse. So they needed something to inflame black voters to remind them of their skin color and try to get them to come out for Obama. And this was the, the game plan of the media. So with zero media interest, uh, even though Rachel Gentile admitted in her first interview, she admitted, I lied about my name. I lied about my age. I lied about going to the hospital. Her story kept changing. And she admitted at the end she was lying. They didn't they were, had no interest in that. Wild. And the second reason is that Zimmerman's attorneys had to spend two thirds of their time in court 
just putting sanctions on the prosecutors and demanding discovery because they wouldn't give them the information they had a right to have. Just one example, they claim that Rachel Gentel, who was 18 at the time, they said she's only 16, so you can't speak to the girlfriend because uh, until right before the trial because she's a minor. Right. Now, when she shows up for her deposition before the trial, now she's 19. Yes. So, So the prosecution was on board with this. They did everything they could to prevent information from coming out. The media was working with them, the Obama administration. Everyone was working together to prevent this information from coming out. Now, despite that, Rachel Gentel in court was a disaster. She couldn't put two sentences together. Uh, She kept changing her story. She said she couldn't read a letter that she wrote to Trayvon's mother that was signed Diamond Eugene. Yes, I had a I had a forensic handwriting expert look at it and 100 percent. It was not signed by Rachel and it was signed by Diamond Eugene. And uh, you look, even at that time, people were saying, wait a minute. This girl is about 150 pounds heavier than Trayvon. She goes to a different school. Uh, she doesn't even show up in school. She's a year older. People were saying, I don't think that's his girlfriend. Something's wrong here. Uh, and only it took me six years later to, to really understand how wrong it could be. They didn't really look like kids to me. Say again? I said they didn't even look like kids to me uh, when I saw them. Uh, yeah. yeah. The footage of the courtroom uh, footage and, of course, later in your film, you show her walking around. Yeah, I mean, look, it was just this monumental hoax, and it was a very evil idea. The evil idea was let's use the tragic death of this very troubled teen, black teenager, to put a Hispanic man in prison so we can control black voters. That's how evil the idea was. And uh, Al Sharpton was in on it from the beginning. He was down there with the family. The uh, Crump, the attorney for the Martin family, said, said, I wanted somebody with a track record. You know, we called up to New York City. We got Al Sharpton to come down here. Well, Al Sharpton's track record was race hoaxes, uh, Tawana Brawley inciting riots like the uh, Freddy's Fashion Mart. And he was an advisor to Obama. So you put that whole cabal together and you get a very corrupt case where a lot of people were used. And in the end, no one has suffered more from this Trayvon hoax than the black youth of America. Oh, by the way, let's not forget one more prominent player. That was uh, Frederica Wilson. Um, She was also... Uh, one of the main players in this as well. well. I would say she's a main player. She was the congresswoman for that area, and she would come down and just say insightful things that weren't even true. She'd say, uh, Trayvon Martin is a young man who's never been in trouble, you know, and uh, she was part of the group that would try to, to incite and mislead uh, the information. This yes, was information me, warfare. Let me explain what I meant by that. I, yeah. I meant to say is that, her clip of her saying, I'm going to say it like yeah, I see it, Trayvon was hunted down like a rabid dog. That was played all over the place. Well, she also made several statements in Congress as well. She was pushing this narrative. <laughs> Wild. Uh, very, very strong. A lot of, there were other pastors were in on it. You know, religious people would come down and make these false statements, this like a lynch mob, like want to put a lynch mob together, even though. There's nothing in Christianity that says, let's let's get us a lynch mob and, and lynch this Hispanic kid based on no evidence. Hold on. Let me stop you right there. Let's get uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, George Zimmerman in a moment here. But I wanted to backtrack really quickly to something you mentioned. And I watched your latest video from the National Press Club where you okay. talked about all these things and you quoted the Bible, I believe. That's right. There's a it's it's uh, a little ironic that. Uh, Trayvon's mother, by the way, is um, Sabrina Fulton is running for office. She's running for Miami-Dade commissioner right now. And by the way, she knew about the witness switch. It's in the film. So she's got a lot of explaining to do. And she did not come forward to say this Rachel Gentile is not Diamond Eugene. She did not say that even though she knew it. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say. But she, she's been kind of pushing this Trayvon hoax for years. She does all these speeches and she tells everybody, people want to kill you because of the color of your skin. And she pushes this narrative, which is a total lie. And, uh, and it's divisive and it's not true. Very divisive. Uh, and, and, Joel, uh, but, but in these ahead. speeches, she often would quote from Proverbs six. Yes. Uh, she'd quote from Proverbs six. So I remember I went and I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to check out that Proverbs six. And, but she would only quote from the first few lines of it. And uh, what I did is I said, uh, I read the whole thing. And what I noticed is a very interesting line at the end. And it goes like this. The very last three lines that she doesn't quote from, it goes like this. 
For the Lord hates a heart that devises wicked plans, a false witness who breathes out lies and who sows discord among brothers. And this is what Rachel Gentile did, and uh, Sabrina knew about it, and she didn't uh, didn't say anything. So it's a little ironic or interesting that she doesn't yes. quote the end of that verse. Yes, and another thing I did want to ask you, Joel, was are, are you religious, Joel? I'm kind of a traditional person. I'm, uh, you know, uh, religious to some extent, so uh, I wouldn't describe it uh, any other way. You don't put yourself in a box? No. Okay, understood. Uh, I, I was just very curious if you perhaps grew up in a religious household. I wanted to ask you early on, but I thought this would be a, a good time to ask. Yeah, well, I grew up in kind of a, a small town in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, we had a we're members of a conservative Jewish congregation, so a kind of traditional conservative uh, Jewish family. Understood. And are you still following the Jewish practices now at all? Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. I consider myself the same. Oh, no. Okay. Understood. I'm not exactly a, a religious person or anything, but definitely not against any religion at all. I think okay, it's, well, yeah, I think it's well important you know, for, I, I've, I've always uh, followed uh, different religious, uh, learned about different religions. Uh, several, I studied uh, Islamic history, and I'm considered somewhat of an expert on Islamism and Islamic history. I've made two films and written many articles about it. Uh, I made a film called uh, Bob Dylan's Jesus Years, inside mm. Bob Dylan's Jesus Years, Busy Being Born Again. And I explored Bob Dylan's uh, three religious albums and the whole uh, Jesus People movement, the Vineyard Christian Fellowship Church in the L.A. in the late 70s that Dylan became a part of. And I talked to all these pastors and really learned of this born again experience that many of them went through, including Bob Dylan. So I have an affinity and knowledge uh, for different religions and I'm able to uh, you know, draw from things that are of interest when, when needed. Understood. And I did want to get back to uh, George Zimmerman really quickly here. I was curious to ask you, what sort of effect did he have during during the trial? Well, he, he told, uh, first of all, he's in the film. Uh, I interview him in the movie and he has actually not done any interviews on this case ever. Don't forget, he did not uh, participate in his own trial. So when you get the uh, the movie or the book as well, it's also ebook. You can hear from George Zimmerman the entire. We will walk him through the entire incident of what happened, and he explains it. And uh, he said the trial was very devastating on him, and even afterwards. And the main reason I think is what he described his background. Uh, first of all, he was an Obama supporter. He was a social justice activist. He was into hope and change. He uh, told me he would mentor black kids whose parents were in prison uh, in his spare time. He had joined a mentoring group where they would go and mentor mostly minority kids to, you know, help them out and give them a, some kind of stability because their parents were in prison. So here's a guy that's a talk the talk, walk the walk minority activist. And they accuse him of being a racist and a bigot. I mean, that was just very devastating, the betrayal. Uh, he's a Hispanic kid. He speaks fluent Spanish. And they made him out to be this white racist somehow. And that was just very hurtful and devastating to him. But I would definitely, you, you, you'll see him in the film for the first time. It's it's an amazing thing to kind of get to know him. Yes, I've seen those um, short clips of, of him and you talking together. And I can't help but feel this way. And I know this is going to give me some heat. And uh, you might not like this either. Well, but... don't say anything controversial. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to. This is, this is how it goes here. Well, okay, we may have to bleep <laughs> it out, but go ahead, give it a shot. Well, you know, the thing is, when I look at George Zimmerman, and gosh, I, I hate to judge him. I really do. But he kind of strikes me as someone who isn't all there 100%. Someone, someone that I might even find across at a Walmart at 2 a.m. Maybe that's ex extremely judgmental uh, well, to say. Well, look, uh, look uh, the media spent uh, billions of dollars in earned media trying to project an image of Zimmerman as this thuggish, you know, knucklehead. Right. And, and even the best of us, I mean, I had a certain impression of him before I met him sure, because sure. that's what you see in the media. Even when you're not paying attention, you see these stories. Uh, for example, after the trial, he was caught in a number of incidences uh, acting out. That's true. And, and I asked him in the film, I said, you know, he said, he said, look, uh, they made me out to be this horrible, uh, jerk and bigot. And he said, I started acting out. I, if they were going to 
say that's who I was when I knew I wasn't. He said, I was just going to show them that I could be. And he said it took him a couple of years to get through it, to go back to being the person he was. So uh, I certainly encourage you to watch the entire film and, you know, decide for yourself. Yeah. But you're, you're talking about a guy that he lived in a crappy rental townhome. He went to school and worked and whatever spare money he had, he used it to go mentor black kids whose parents were in prison. So that's the kid. I mean, who, who would do that? Who, who does that? To do yeah. that? That's who, a nice who, thing to do. Who, who with that that's true. E- economic level would actually go spend their spare time to help minority youth. So you can imagine the kind of guy he was and how he was so devastated that uh, he was thrown under the bus by the president of the United States of all people uh, and how he talked about his journey recovering from it as well as the incident itself. So I certainly recommend everyone watch the movie and judge for yourself. Definitely. And from my limited understanding of George Zimmerman, he wanted to be a police officer, correct? I think he had several different careers. He was trying to be a uh, insurance adjuster. Mm. At one time, he said he had uh, applied to be a police officer. He had several different career paths he was in and out of uh, when this incident happened. I think he was an insurance adjuster at the time. Understood. And during the the night when this happened, he was, I guess, some sort of neighborhood watchman of sorts. Uh, not exactly. Again, you got to see the film. He explains it, that uh, they had a lot of crime in this neighborhood right. and they, they had a neighborhood watch group that he was a part of. Yes. Uh, he was not on a on a patrol. There was no such thing as a neighborhood watch patrol. They had just received instructions from the police. They said, if you see anybody hanging around that you don't recognize, uh, better be safe than sorry. Give us a call to the non-emergency number. And he said he had done that several times, as had other uh, residents. And uh, that's what he did in this case. Yes. And that takes us to the 911 call. And I heard the call not very long ago just to refresh my memory. And uh, during the conversation with, I believe, might be a police officer of sorts, they ask him if he's following uh, the gentleman in question. And he says, yes. And the police officer says, OK, uh, we don't need you to do that. Uh, do you recall that? Uh, I recall that I did ask him about it, and uh, it's very interesting, his response. I don't want to give away the entire film, but uh, he explains that uh, the dispatcher kept asking him which way did he go, which way did he go. So eventually he felt he had to help them out. He got out of his car. He said he never saw Trayvon at all during that time. And then at some point the guy said, are you following him? And he said, yes. He says, we don't need you to do that. And he said, OK. And I said to George, it's in the film. I said, why did you why did you answer yes when they said, are you following him? And he said he just kind of shortchanged the answer. He said he he didn't mean he was following. He never saw him. He just uh-huh. meant to say I was walking a direction that I had seen him. So they took that little short answer and turned it into a murder uh, indictment. Uh, but very comprehensive interview in the film. And you really get the entire story also in the book. It's also an ebook, And uh, that's just one of the pieces of the puzzle. And uh, the bigger piece of the puzzle, of course, that the film is focused on is there was a girl on the phone with Trayvon Martin during this time. And she knew what he was saying about Zimmerman. And she knew what he what he was talking about or planning to do. And uh, that girl uh, was replaced with uh, Rachel Gentel, who pretended to be Diamond Eugene and uh, committed one of the biggest frauds on on right. this uh, judicial system that led to ultimately the Ferguson effect, all this crime disaster for all the black neighborhoods. Uh, and it all started at this kind of ground zero from this hoax. And let me ask, let me ask you this, Joel. Do you think he should have followed him? Do I think Zimmerman should have gotten out of his car? And followed uh, Trayvon. You, you got to kind of look at the film. I mean, George says that he was trying to help the dispatcher. Yes, but Joe, I'm asking, and, and, I'm asking yeah, you, however. He, I'm telling you. Um, yes. He clarified that he was not following him. That, And that makes sense when you look at the physical evidence. He clarified that uh, the uh, he told, when the dispatcher said, are you following? He said, yes, that he should have explained, I'm going in the direction I last saw him. But he's saying he never actually saw him at all during that time. And then when he's about 10 yards from his car, he's walking back to his car and the physical evidence shows that that's where they were. That's when he says uh, he was attacked by Trayvon, who sucker punched him and broke his nose near his car. Now, obviously, uh, Rachel Gentel told a completely different story. And again, she wasn't even on the phone with Trayvon, but she claimed that uh, Trayvon was, you know, back at his dad's house 
when this altercation took place. But the, all the again, all the physical evidence shows that everything Zimmerman said was true, and that's why the police uh, decided that it was self-defense. Interesting. And, of course, we are talking about the film and book, The Trayvon Hoax, unmasking the witness fraud that divided America. And, uh, my goodness, here we are, 2019, almost 2020, and we still are having all sorts of issues amongst ourselves, uh, Joe. It, it's quite an insane time. And there is another a fake hate crime that recently happened not too long ago with a former NFL player, I believe, who, right. yes, uh, I believe it was in Georgia. Right. That was not long. Of course, people know the Jesse Smollett case, the right. ridiculous idea that at two in the morning in sub-zero Chicago. Hold on, Joe. Let me, uh, let me just yeah. ask you. Let me, let me butt in really quickly. When you heard, first heard of the Juicy Smollett uh, case, did you honestly think that happened the way it did? I remember hearing some details and thinking that it was total baloney that, <laughs> but, but the media fell for it. Like only the media could fall for that story. Two in the morning, sub zero weather in Chicago of all places. And, uh, and he tells about being attacked by, by Trump supporters. So you got to really remember this is why this film is so important. The media was not in the tank back in 2012 until this case happened. All the race hoaxes, Brett Kavanaugh, fake witnesses, multiple fake witnesses uh, that later admitted they lied. Fake witnesses. Where was the first fake witness? Rachel Gentel. So I think if we can show how the original race hoax fake news story of, of uh, 2012, the George Zimmerman case, uh, that this may help kind of bring us back together and heal the country. Uh, Colin Kaepernick started kneeling and protesting America uh, for nothing. Uh, he can go back to the 49ers now because, no pun intended, he literally got played. Everybody got played by this story into thinking that uh, this media narrative that there are armed white men in the streets just looking to shoot people because of their skin color is total nonsense. And the real problem for black youth, as you'll see when you look at my film, is not armed white men in the streets. The real problem is the lack of strong black men in the home to give guidance and steer them away from drugs, gangs, and uh, and fighting that Trayvon was getting into. Yes, and going back to the fake hate crime really quickly, for those that were wondering, we were uh, talking about the former NFL player Edon Kaufman, who um, was charged with a false report of a crime, insurance fraud, concealing a license plate he was arrested and bonded out of uh, jail recently. Uh, for, well, shortly after he basically ransacked his own business front and tag swastikas all over the place. And, yeah, there, there uh, may MAGA. there may have been more fake Lord. race crimes than real ones in the past six years since this time. But the social activists and even knuckleheads like this guy, they learned that if you make up a, a race hoax, the media will go with it. They don't care. So that's why if you can say like Benjamin Crump and Sharpton, that Trayvon just had some Skittles and iced tea. He was just trying to make a candy run. That was the whole story. Then why wouldn't you make up hands up, don't shoot? Because the media will never question you. So this has encouraged social activists and liars and people with ridiculous judgment like this NFL player to try to use race to achieve uh, very nefarious things. Just as this original case was really meant to use Trayvon. Trayvon has a legacy. His legacy was stolen by left-wing activists and uh, and the media and political agendas, uh, his real legacy really was a teachable moment. And the teachable moment was the uh, lack of guidance he had and the lack of, of parenting he had with his divorced parents. And he was able to go with his gangster friends and get into all these terrible behaviors that ended up leading to this terrible confrontation. Right. And uh, speaking of Eugene Diamond, how does she feel about the film that you put forth as well as Trayvon Martin's parents? Well, we don't you know. know yet. I, I just uh, put the film out a week ago Monday. Oh, okay. and they don't I'm, even I'm know. Lo I'm, I'm looking at Diamond's uh, Twitter and she's still tweeting like she doesn't uh, she hasn't heard about it. Mm. I, we have not heard from Trayvon's parents or anybody now. This movie is still a little bit in the conservative ghetto in terms of the uh, coverage. <laughs> yes, right. So and I don't believe that they live in the conservative ghetto media. So uh, I think any day now we're going to see some reaction. But so far, I haven't seen any yet. But I think Rachel Gentel needs to come forward. Diamond Eugene, 
Sabrina, Fulton all need to come forward and come clean and say what they knew and what the truth is. And I agree 100 percent. And of course, the first time I heard of you, Joel, was when you interviewed Malik Obama. I was um, very skeptical at the time. I wasn't sure how accurate any of this was. The first time I had heard uh, things about Obama, the the, uh, birth certificate thing, all all those sort of things that were going on in the media during the time, uh, during his presidency. At, At the time, I thought all of this was just made up to smear Obama to make him look bad. And then years later, I find out they weren't exactly lying. Yeah, I mean, look, Obama put forth his book, Dreams for My Father, It was, of course, he had a lot of help writing it. There's a lot of evidence. I think Jack Castro wrote all about it. The first one that uh, Bill Ayers, his uh, terrorist emeritus, uh, former weather underground terrorist, buddy of his, helped him write it. I was actually going to interview him, by the way. Oh, I'd like to interview him. But uh, Chris Anderson later wrote a biography called Barack and Michelle, a very friendly, positive uh, biography that he had a lot of help from all of the Obama people. And he kind of spilled the beans and they got mad at him because he spent six pages talking about Bill Ayers wrote that. So Obama had uh, written the book about his background as this street kid in Hawaii who suffered all this racial discrimination and, you know, the Kenyan father. But in that book, he spends a lot of time talking about Frank Marshall Davis, all the time he spends with Frank Marshall Davis. And that's what got me curious. I started looking into Frank Marshall Davis, who wrote a biography called Live in the Blues. And there's all these photos of Davis in his own biography, autobiography, and it looks just like Obama. And Obama looked nothing like the Kenyan. So that's what put I put together this uh, film called Dreams for My Real Father to show the close relationship, the influence of this black Bolshevik communist uh, named Frank Marshall Davis on Obama's policies. And I think you can see that they did have a tremendous influence, even by Obama's own admission. Uh, and I interviewed Malik Obama, the uh, alleged half brother from Kenya. That was something was, else. Yeah, he was Obama's best man at wow. his wedding. and. He looks nothing like him either. And he, he, he saw the film and even based on Barack's behavior, he said that as soon as Obama became president, he wanted nothing to do with the Kenyans. Yeah, he didn't help. Well, I know that he just wanted nothing to do. He never went to Kenya, never invited them. He wanted a lot to do with them to build up this background story. Uh, but as soon as he became president, he wanted nothing to do with any of the Kenyan Obamas. And Malik ended up seeing the film and really pretty much agreeing that that uh, this Obama could be a complete fraud and con. Yes, it's pretty cold blooded to actually hear the words of um, his own brother uh, speaking about him and how they they basically well, how Obama basically wants nothing to do with them. Yeah, it was pretty sad. He even told the story when there when the aunt uh, died up in uh, Boston, how he tried to get Barry Barack to give him, you know, some money to help send the body back to Kenya and he refused. So yeah, it's on YouTube still. It's a Joel Gilbert interview with Malik Obama. Pretty revelatory. I think it's it's uh, something that will be of great interest for a long time to come. Yes, it's very wild. And on a side note, is it true Obama calls Michelle Obama Michael? No, I don't think so. I think that's a joke. That's just what's that nonsense. all about? Why do people on the internet uh, keep repeating this, uh, especially to me too? I don't know. I think that's just entertainment. I think it's just entertainment. I don't think it's uh, yeah, that's not true at all. I've heard people come on here even claiming that Michelle was a man. And of course, I have never gone uh, with no. any of those statements personally. Yeah, that's just so there's some silliness out there. There's real research, which is what I did on Obama's background. And you get a lot of silliness, too. And unfortunately, the real stuff is very serious because Obama made a big effort to divide the country. That's part of that. Uh, you know, community organizer thing he did in Chicago, really the real job is community agitator. They want people to protest. They want people to demand. They want people to be angry. That's the entire ideology of community organizing. Yeah, Joe, here, here's a good example of that. Uh, John Annan or John Anon in the chat room, rather, he says, Big Mike has her own bathroom. See, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about that nonsense Ugh. anymore. If you want to talk about Obama, we will, but that's, I've had it yes. with that silly, silly stuff. Okay. Don't quote me. Uh, Definitely. I hear you. Okay. No problem. Yes. And of course, now in terms of the recent times in the political realm, uh, many people have echoed that our current president is the one responsible for all the latest in division. What are your thoughts and reactions to that? Well, we've watched this thing play out, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, Operation Crossfire Hurricane. Uh, the Obama is uh, 
it's it's been very well documented that they had been using the intelligence agencies and the other tools of state the entire time they were in office in 2012 don't forget they used the IRS to uh suppress and disperse the Tea Party movement the Tea Party movement was a natural grassroots movement against mostly the financial abuses uh of the federal government and they made great strides and you know got rid of hundreds of of uh democrats and elected republicans in 2010 and obama reacted by using the irs to uh, break up all the tea party groups and tea party movements so the grassroots movement of the republicans was uh you know disrupted and disbanded by the obama administration that was an illegal interference in the electoral process in 2012 uh, the Republicans didn't do too much about it. They investigated a little bit and got blown off. So, of course, a couple years later, Obama uses the DOJ, FBI, uh, CIA, or is learning, still learning more every day, to investigate uh, Trump and set him up to try to uh, do, spy on his candidacy, spy on his campaign. It's still coming out day by day. It's still being investigated. And so it's a shocking abuse of power. But this is what uh, far left socialists do when they get into power. That's the history because their policies don't work. And the only way to keep power is to use the tools of state to maintain power. And we saw Obama do that. And you see the, uh, Democrat candidates now. You can just see they're out in the open. It's not as stealth as it was during Obama's time, but, uh, they're just saying we want to get rid of the electoral college. We want to get rid of the second amendment. We want to, uh, stack the Supreme Court. So the whole socialist uh, agenda is an anti-democrat agenda because it the the policies themselves uh don't do anything but cause misery and division and using the, the tools of state is the only way they can stay in power. So Trump has been dealing with this since he's been president and uh he got over the uh, the Russia hook stuff and so now they're trying the Ukraine hook the and it, yes. It just shows you how because socialism is so uncreative. Socialism is a war on creativity. So they can't think even of really original ideas. So all they can remember is, well, we used to work with the Russians a lot. Teddy Kennedy is known for going to work with the Russians and asking for help to, uh, you know, to defeat Ronald Reagan. Uh, many uh, uh, Soviet agents have been uh, infiltrated the Democrat Party over time. So the only thing they can think of is they say, well, let's say that Trump works for the Russians. And you'd think because that failed, they come up with something more original, but they just kind of recycled it into, well, you're asking the Ukrainians, you know, I thought when Trump re re released his uh, transcript that the whole thing would go away, but they, they don't care about facts anymore because the media is completely behind them. And uh, it's very shocking. And that's why it's important for uh, independent journalists like myself to, to do to go deep dive and do the work that I've done, such as with this uh, George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin case, because if this had not happened, nothing of that nature would be going on right now. The media would not think they can get away with stuff when they could recreate George Zimmerman from a Hispanic minority advocate into a racist white, white guy and nobody questioned it. Yes. They, they realized they could get away with anything and it continues to this day. And for the record, I'm not affiliated to any political party. And Joe, I'm not. Are you affiliated to any party, Joe? Uh, no, I'm not affiliated with any party. Understood. Understood. And I also wanted to get your opinion on the current list of Democrats who are trying to take the chair from one Donald J. Trump. Um, what is your opinion after all the debates that we've seen so far? Uh, who do you think would even stand a chance, in your opinion? Uh, I think none of them would stand a chance. I mean, the, the thing that's most scary is, well, we have a two-party system, uh, pretty much, and one day someone from this party could win, whether it's 2020 or 24. Right. And they have absolutely promised to end the constitutional republic as we know it. They all want to have open borders. If you have open borders, that's the end of the United States. They want to eliminate amendment after amendment. Uh, that's very frightening, even if, you know, Trump only won by a couple thousand votes in a couple of states. Now, Hillary would have executed those same plans and we would never have known how they were using the federal government against the American people, against the uh, political process. Uh, so it, 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 despite thinking none of them can win, if one of them do one day, there's not going to be any more uh, free elections after that, I, I fear. Um, even in this 2020, don't assume just because, uh, well, let me make two points. Number one is the polls are going to be uh, irrelevant because 
if you're a Trump supporter and a strange person calls you from an unknown number and says, who are you going to vote for? Knowing what they would do is put you on a blacklist, try to get you fired from work, whatever it might be. No one is going to say Trump. You're going to be very careful. Or you might just say Bernie just to mess with them. So the polls are going to be irrelevant. And uh, look here in California, Motor Voter Act, illegal aliens are allowed to have now driver's licenses and you automatically get registered to vote. So even if I say, well, Trump has an easy win, it doesn't mean the vote is going to be uh, uh, fair or honest because we have vote in advance, vote three weeks in advance, vote by mail. Uh, you know, they have vote harvesting where leftist groups can come and pick up your ballots and take them to the polling station for you. There's so many ways now to game the system. You just have to wonder if we really will have fair elections. Yes, great points there. I was quite displeased myself with the Democratic candidates. I really don't think many of them have a chance. Uh, Joe Biden was ahead on polls the last time I checked. But again, you can't really you can't really accurately measure anything with polls today. And uh, some people think Joe Biden is completely done after all the latest scandals uh, are surfacing now, Joe. Yeah, I, I never, even though he was leading the polls, I didn't, I, I don't think. That's uh, hard to believe. He, he's anyone's really going to support him. Uh, I don't think he'd have much of a chance. So I, I expected either to be Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris, even though she's down in the polls. Uh, there's a lot of media pushing for her and polling for her. And a lot of people think she'd be the best uh, contrast uh, from the Democrat side to go up against Trump. And how are you currently right now in terms of Donald J. Trump? Where do you stand with him? Uh, can you be more specific? Uh, in other words, are you completely satisfied with his current run? And will you be, well, I don't know if I should even ask you, but will you be supporting him on his next run? Well, I was originally a Cruz supporter, uh, I believe, and then I went over to, I, I was in favor of Trump. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, that Trump is simply the only thing standing between the, uh, the Democrat socialist agenda, the deep state, uh, the abuses of power, the corruption under Obama, that, uh, Trump is the only thing standing between them and us. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Obama had this slogan that I had in my film. Uh, he said, of course, people remember when he said, we're going to fundamentally transform America. And no one exactly knew what he meant by that. But he had something that people didn't always hear. And it's in my film where he says the American people will embrace the change. And the theory of socialism is you're going to impose all these rules. You can't have this. Now, now you can't have cars. You can't have emissions. You can't have light bulbs. You can't have guns. You can't say this. You can't say that. This is the change where they are the the uh, the rulers who, pr pr who who know better than everybody else. And they say, as soon as we impose all these changes, everyone will eventually grow to love it. That's the theory of socialism. I'll, and, yeah, I'll be honest with you. A part of me doesn't like Donald and another part of me really does like him. Um, what I mean by that is, of course, your book, The Art of the insult. I, I think you cover it quite, quite well. And some of the things that I do like about him, I do like the whole pro wrestling uh, gimmick and aspect of him. I do like that he used those sort of promotions to get himself over with America. I, I think that was actually a brilliant move on his part. And he's, he's quite amusing, Joel. And I do like him on a personal level. Yeah. Well, he, uh, people forget that his real estate, he became famous because of real estate. But right. the last 20 years, he was actually much more active in the entertainment business than he was in real estate. He had The Apprentice for about 15 years. He promoted professional boxing, of course, Miss America, right. pro wrestling. He owned a USFL team. So here's someone that was really in the entertainment business and understood marketing and branding and uh, how to uh, to express himself in succinct ways and how to promote himself and promote his messaging. So he really was and is uh, an entertainment professional, even more so than a real estate guy. And I think people didn't understand that how much it was weighted on the entertainment side. And when you see my film, Trump, the Art of the Insult, I think you can really appreciate it. Great stuff. And of course, I do wanted to ask you a few more things before I, I let you go here. But I, I was curious your take on Jeffrey Epstein and how quickly the uh, mainstream media really has let it go. I don't know. I haven't followed it. I don't know too much about it. Um, I thought that uh, Epstein's lawyer made a good point when he died. The lawyer put out a statement saying, 
look, this this guy would not have been uh, arrested or even put in prison if not for the fact that Trump had employed his prosecutor as a uh, cabinet member and that there was no reason for him to have been kept in solitary or in prison. They could have let him go home with a, uh, you know, an electronic GPS that it was way overkill and that essentially he had, the lawyer said he'd served his sentence, even though people didn't agree with it. He served his sentence like 10 or 15 years ago, that these were all new allegations. So that did disturb me a little bit that uh, was it really necessary? Did they have to, to throw someone in prison uh, without, uh, you know, getting to the point where someone would kill themselves or, as some people suspect, may have, may have been targeted? Understood. Pretty interesting, I, I thought. That Jeffrey Epstein, it's, it's really wild how, how he's been able to do all these sort of things. Yeah, not, not an area I know a lot about, honestly. Yeah, it's okay. It's just something that it's a interesting sort of a story that has a lot of people wanting to know more uh, about. And uh, speaking of which, are, are you currently doing any other uh, works right now in terms of uh, filmmaking or books in the works, Joe? Well, uh, I've got a couple of uh, projects and ideas always in development. Uh, right now, we just released uh, the Trayvon Hoax uh Unmasking the witness fraud that divided America. So I'm kind of full time doing interviews and promotions and might be going to do some book signings in Florida as well as some film screenings. So I probably won't have a new film for a while, uh, for a little while, but I'm really going to enjoy talking about this because I think it's so important to uh, explain and expose how this case uh, divided America for no reason. It led directly to that Ferguson effect, been a crime disaster for black neighborhoods, homicides up 33%. And I think if we can really look, go back and look at this case, and I've got a lot of emails even from black teenagers, and they say, man, we grew up on this stuff. We thought that, uh, you know, Trayvon was, you know, victimized and all this. And now they realize it was all a hoax that Rachel Gentel was not on the phone with him. She was not his girlfriend. They switched her out. And the real phone witness, uh, you know, knew a completely different story. And everyone got manipulated. They got played. We all got played by this race hoax. And people are, I think, going to really open their eyes to realize this entire racial division, racial narrative is complete nonsense. I grew up in Tennessee in the 80s, and we all grew up together, black and white kids. We're all friends. There was no N-word. I never heard the N-word. It was. It's just insane that 30 years later, they want to tell us, the Democrats want to tell us that America's racist. And, oh, okay, well, if it, you don't see racism, it's in the system. Okay. Oh, it's in your DNA. It's just disgusting and stupid and nonsensical. And hopefully this film will make people realize that. For sure. And how do you personally feel about Rachel Gentel's role in all of this, my friend? Well, look, uh, pretending to be someone else at a murder trial. Oh, my goodness. You know, is very serious. <laughs> uh, uh, George Zimmerman could have could have gotten years in prison or maybe the death penalty. And uh, she did, at the end of her first interview, she did tell the prosecutors, I know about it twice. I feel guilty. She tried to get out of it. Uh, but then she proceeded to go ahead and testify against Zimmerman. And uh, she was an 18-year-old ninth grader. She'd been held back two years. She read on a fourth grade level if she could read at all. So uh, at first I was trying to feel a little uh, sympathy toward her a little bit, but uh, she did a... Uh, Jay-Z did a six-part series called Rest in Power last year on the Trayvon Martin case. Very incendiary, all the lies and, and nonsense. And he damn near got Andrew Gillum elected governor by inciting all this race stuff. And there was Rachel Gentel again in Jay-Z's documentary, lying again, pretending to be Diamond Eugene. They even played excerpts. God bless Jay-Z. They played excerpts of that phone call with Crump. And it sounded nothing like, you know, and Rachel's sitting there just lying and so I, I don't feel too much sympathy for her because she didn't have to come back eight years, six years later and lie again. She's the first one that needs to come forward. I mean, she committed perjury as an 18 year old, as an adult. And uh, the, the consequences have just been horrific. Would, would you like them, Joel, to come forward and to uh, tell the American people the truth? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we I, I, I do these films because not only to tell a story, but I hope it has a greater good to educate people and and resolve things. And certainly Rachel Gentel needs to come forward and admit that she lied 
uh, in court that she was not on the phone with Trayvon. It's all completely proven in the film, the phone records, DNA, handwriting samples. Diamond Eugene should come forward. Trayvon's mother, when it happened, she wasn't in on it at, when it was planned. But as soon as the witness switch was made, she knew about it. And uh, she knew Rachel Gentel was not Diamond Eugene. She'd met her. She'd talked to her mother. She'd been to her house. Uh, she, you know, talked on the phone with her. She knew Rachel was not Diamond Eugene. And I'm not going to spoil the film. You can actually see the exact moment and the evidence. So she needs to come forward. She wants to be a politician. You know, she's running for Miami-Dade commissioner. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, so she wow. Needs, she needs, yeah, she needs <laughs> to come clean because uh, just because Trayvon died in this tragic death does not mean that hundreds of other black kids had to die because of this racial strife that happened afterwards. So now my mouth is open. Or my jaw is hanging here. Uh, Joy, I did not know that. Wow. Well, you got to watch she, the movie, she read is, the ebook. Uh, <laughs> she's really the trying Trayvon to do that. Com. So she's all in. She's really going to try to do this. She's running for, for office. And, wow. Uh, I hope uh, when this film disseminates a little more, it's only been out for about 10 days, but uh, hopefully some reporters will ask her to, to come forward and tell the truth. My goodness. And Joe, another thing I did want to ask you, in, in terms of InfoWars, are you still affiliated with those people? I did a number of interviews over the years on my films. I did a couple guest host spots and haven't done that for well over a year. Yeah, I was going to say. I have not heard from them. I was going to say, I haven't seen you um, out there yet. Yeah, I'm doing mostly, uh, unfortunately, mostly conservative uh, talk radio. I wish some of the uh, middle of the road, I guess there's not that many liberal talk radio shows. But I'm hoping to do more and more uh, radio and ultimately TV. I mean, Hannity covered the Zimmerman case more than anybody. He I actually interviewed you, George. I thought you were on Hannity at one time. Uh, I, I was. That's a different story. But I wanted to tell you about how oh, go ahead. Hannity covered the Zimmerman case. Uh, he interviewed Zimmerman. He was all over it. So you'd think that with his film coming out, I did send the information to his producers and they haven't called me. So you, you're just a little disappointing that uh, – a lot of the so-called mainstream conservative people are still a little don't quite understand how important this case was to, uh, you know, to uh, changing the country for, for the worse. And it's very important to go back and look at it uh, and reexamine it and look at what really happened. So I'd certainly hope that Hannity would want to have me on or, uh, you know, examine the evidence because uh, it was such an important case that he covered so, so well. Yes. Hannity was all over it for that short period of time. He was talking about it all day, every day. Uh, but now it seems like their whole coverage is just primarily on uh, what's going on with which. Well, Hannity in particular, he, he's been uh, still talking about the fake dossier. Yeah, he's all over that story. It does not stop, little, though. Yeah, it gets a little repetitive over time. Um but uh, people have been following uh, the changes at Fox News, of course. Uh, there seems to be kind of a conservative ghetto that might be holding up the stock price uh, between Hannity, Tucker, and Laura in the evening. And they tend to go a little more liberal during the day, it seems. And uh, you might have seen the Roger Ailes, uh, you know, the Loudest Voice series on Showtime. Uh, I did follow it. And I remember my film Dreams from My Real Father. A friend of mine took it to Roger Ailes and showed it to him before it even came out. And said, maybe you want to have Joel come on and talk about Obama's background and you don't have to agree with it or not. You can have him on one of the shows. And Roger Ailes watched the entire hour and a half movie in his office with him. And when the film was over, Roger Ailes said to my friend, this is incredible, but we can't touch this. So that's that, weird. That was even in 2012. They made some decision that they can't talk about Obama's background. They were afraid of, you know, getting accused of something. Uh, and they had also lost Glenn Beck recently. If you remember, Glenn Beck was Glenn very Beck. strong on Obama's background. Like he was saying, look, who who believes this kind of stuff? Who do you know that that wants to apologize for America? Who do you know that has friends who are terrorists? Who do you know? You know, Glenn Beck was heavy on this Obama's background and uh, the media matters. And those types went advertisers. They went after him and they couldn't sell advertisers. So they had to let Glenn Beck go. So even back then was already trying to stay away from certain subjects that, you know, yeah, you're going to have, you're gonna have to do this. OAN, One America News Network, OAN is just fantastic. They're, I think they're going to end up taking over that Fox audience that they're running away from. Uh, they were at my press conference in DC, One America News. Uh, Chanel Rion was the correspondent, did a great job. And they're just covering it like it is. They're not afraid of any subjects. Yeah, that's one thing that I am concerned for you, Joel, is 
the popularity in what's called the cancel culture now. And we've seen plenty of this all over Twitter and uh, Facebook and all over the place, really. And uh, Joe, people like you and me, uh, they'll try to censor us, my friend, eventually. You know, let's hope not. I, uh, it's certainly something to watch out for. We never know if we're being shadow banned or something. That uh, happened to me already. <laughs> I, I, I found once I put something out there, it takes them a few years sometimes, but uh, they end up kind of getting embarrassed into covering something. I mean, Hannity sounds like I like I used to talk in 2014, my film, There's No Place Like Utopia, where I went around talking to progressive people in progressive cities and people were all, you know, unemployed and very unhappy with how things were going. And I talked about how uh, socialism was this road to nowhere and how the Democrats were really socialists and radicals. And nobody would talk like that at that time. Now I turn on Hannity. It sounds like me, but he was five years behind the times, you know. Uh, so we hope, uh, you know, the, the media will pick up on these stories. And this one is so compelling. I'm showing all the proof that Rachel Gentile perjured herself in the biggest racial trial since OJ and it divided the country. And not only that, but I'm giving you the name of the real witness and she's in the movie, uh, the real person that was, uh, was substituted from. And I think that hopefully will prove irresistible. They're going to have to cover it. Yes, sir. They're going to have to, for sure. This is a pretty uh, hard hitting uh, piece that you did. And again, I'm very impressed with all your work that you've done. You went beyond what normal journalists uh, would even do, my friend. Yeah, well, I went to the, you know, Miami, the background is a little Haiti because Diamond Eugene and, you know, Rachel, they have a Haitian background. Uh, I went to uh, Tallahassee, the capital city of Florida, of course, to Sanford to meet George Zimmerman and uh, just dove into all the uh, public documents that were available. And then I had to cross-reference Trayvon's cell phone records with uh, all the Twitter accounts and social media, Facebook accounts of all his friends. And the first thing you realize is you say, wait, they, they put way too much information on, on social media. And it's just all there. It's right in front of your eyes. And it's just uh, amazing that no one else chose to do what I did. Indeed, my friend. And of course, you are out there in the Los Angeles area. And I had to tell you before we wrap up things I hear, I wanted to ask you about Los Angeles and the homeless issue. I'm sure you've been uh, down Skid Row a number of times yourself. Well, when you drive downtown, especially, it's the first thing you notice, and it's right. gotten worse uh, over yeah. time. Yeah. And this is a look, I've also been going to New York City uh, every couple months for years for business and other reasons. And also, it's taken a downturn. You didn't used to see homeless people just lying on Fifth Avenue, just laying out like it's their living room with all their furniture. And it's a phenomenon that's happened in uh, most of these Democratic run cities. Um, in my film, of there's no place like utopia. Of course, I was in Detroit where it was just a total disaster. Uh, so many abandoned buildings, homeless people. This is the result of these Democrat run cities where they've been in control for 50, 60 years. They raise and raise the taxes. The businesses end up not being able to function. They leave. And then the people end up uh, without jobs uh, and having to sleep on the street or they also leave and you have these abandoned cities. So you don't have to go too far back in history or too far around the world to see the results of uh, socialist government and corruption. It's right in our American inner cities. Yeah, a few weeks ago, by the way, I needed to uh, assist a gentleman outside of a, he was outside of a building, uh, passed out. Well, coming in and out of consciousness, he was um, high, I'm pretty sure, on heroin. He, um, in his hands, he had a an ID and a syringe. So... Uh, heroin is a big problem out there and out here as well. Yeah, well, it's it's not pretty, and uh, hopefully there'll be some initiatives to. Uh, but but it's just the system. It's the idea that of of uh, high taxation on businesses, restrictions on businesses, such that they can't function, and they end up leaving these cities, leaving no employers, and then there's not enough tax base to support the government programs. They're always expanding, and of course they bring in illegals and give them all these services. And it's a, it's a uh, destructive path. And you're starting to see it in downtown LA, but you know, you go to Detroit and you see the end game of what it can actually lead to. And uh, we need free enterprise. We need, uh, you know, lower taxes to allow business to thrive. People can be employed. It's not a, um, 
you know, something new. It's, it's all there for people to look at the results uh, and the differences between free markets and government control. Yes, sir. And also uh, the people that passed Proposition 57, which was just asinine in my opinion, that would be the nonviolent felonies and crimes. Uh, there's a lot more than just what some people think what that actually means. And uh, some of those people that do those sort of offenses, uh, if you would actually know the reality of what that is, uh, most people in California would not have let that bill pass at all. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. I mean, I've, I've visited some prisons before and, uh, you know, you meet some of these inmates and some of them you feel very sorry for. They say, hey, I was sure. on three strikes law. You know, they they did something that wasn't that big a deal for strike number three. It's oh, my God. Uh, so the, I, I do believe in the prison reform that uh, Trump has initiated. There's there's a lot of stories of, of people that got long, severe sentences that yeah. maybe weren't weren't all that necessary. It's a bit. Of, it's uh, a it's a multi layered issue. Yeah, as things usually are. And Joe, as we wrap things up here, I didn't really talk too much into your personal life, and I, I really don't like to do those sort of things. But uh, Joe, are you married? You don't have to say. The yeah, well, look, uh, we're going like to wrap okay. up. Just talk about the film. It's the uh, Trayvon dot com. And uh, you can get the ebook book live stream right there online. It's links you over to Vimeo and also the paperback on Amazon. And I think you'll really make your head spin. Everyone that's seen this who's uh, written reviews, they're saying they're mad, they're angry, they cried. And uh, they're all I have not had one negative word. They just said the research is incredible. It's all there. And uh, the reckoning needs to come to end this uh, race nonsense that uh, got thrust upon America since 2012. Yes, of course. And of course, your website is joegilbert.net, if I, if I recall correctly, my friend. That's correct. And uh, Highway 61 Entertainment, that's my main corporate site. You can see all my films. It's Highway, H-I-G-H-W-A-Y 61-E-N-T for entertainment, highway61ent.com. But the movie of the day, of course, is uh, the Trayvon Hoax. Dot com. So, you know, thanks for having me and I, I enjoyed our discussion. Yes, no problem, my friend. Great to talk to you and we'll do this again in the near future, my friend. All right. Thanks again. Right, take care. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, that was Joel Gilbert. Definitely check out his work. That's joegilbert.net. J-O-E-L-G-I-L-B-E-R-T.net. For those who needed that. And of course, we will be going on a little break in a moment here. 